Hey everybody, just a quick alert. We are less than four weeks away from our first ever super conference. I'm super pumped about it. Saturday, November 11th and Sunday, November 12th, right here in New York City. We've got a ton of Broadway superpowers ready to tell you all about how they got where they are and how you can get where you want to be. Everyone from Lynn Ahrens to John Rando, Lee Silverman, and a ton more. Go to theproducersperspective.com. Register today. I want to be a producer with a hit show on Broadway. I want to be a producer. Hello, everybody. This is Ken Davenport. You are listening to the Producers Perspective podcast. So we're going to get schooled today on the craft of musical <laughs> theater from one of the best teachers we have in the business. Please welcome to the podcast BMI's Director of Musical Theater, Mr. Pat Cook. Welcome, Pat. Wow, that's quite an introduction. <laughs> well, very Thank well you, deserved. Ken. Having right. sat in your workshop sessions, I've watched you work, and I'm thrilled to introduce you to everyone listening. So one of Pat's primary responsibilities is, of course, helping to run the Lehman Engel Musical Theater Workshop, which you've been affiliated for, is this true, 25 years? No, actually longer than that. I came to BMI in 1983. I came to join the workshop as a writer. And a mere 28 years later, they offered me this job. <laughs> so clearly, I am on the fast track at BMI. So, well, musicals take a long time to develop. So I guess it's the same type of they, thing. They do. So do I. So, so in 1983, how old was the workshop at that point? The workshop it was founded in 1961. So that's the math. It was founded by Lehman Engel in 1961. And when Lehman died in 1982, it was taken over by his students, which included Ed Kleban and Alan Menken and Maury Esten, among others. So tell everyone a little bit about what the workshop's original intent was or what when you walked in there that first day in 1983, what, what were you expecting? I was expecting to have people look at me and say, oh, he knows everything. And it only took a couple of days before I just shut up and sat down and said, I don't think I know everything. I, Skip Kennan was the first year teacher then, and he, he was a great, great teacher for first year. Where did you come from before that? Where, where, Like, what made you think I know everything and you were going to New York? Well, this is kind of my fifth career. I, I started as an actor. I, I came to the big city as an actor. I was on a Broadway show called The Mother's Kisses. I was a chorus boy. That was starred B. Arthur. Had a score by Richard Adler, and we closed in Baltimore, unfortunately. I thought that was going to be my big break. In fact, there was a sign. It turned out to be a very famous story. There was a sign in the Mechanic Theater in Baltimore. It said, occupancy in this theater by more than 2,000 is unlawful. And someone had written underneath and highly unlikely. But um, but. <laughs> so then, yeah, and I was I was in the national tour of 1776. And I was in Dark of the Moon off Broadway and a couple other shows. And then I started playing piano for a living, and uh, I played a lot of piano gigs. And my favorite gig was a place called Marty's, which was 3rd Avenue and 73rd Street. And that had a jazz room. And George Shearing would play there, Tony Bennett, Mel Torme, uh, Joe Williams. And I got to hang out with all of those guys. And uh, I'd still be there if Marty's was still there. It was, it was a great job. But Marty's went bankrupt. And then I decided... I had to decide what I wanted to do with my life. And I thought, well, I think I'm really a writer. So I went to BMI. And talk to me a little bit about what the, the job of the workshop is in, in taking people like yourself in, in that want to be writers. What is the goal? Well, the, Lehman was a Broadway conductor, as you know, of some fame, who was concerned about the lack of craft among musical the, young musical theater writers. So he founded the workshop to teach the craft of musical theater. And that's what we do over there. We talk about the craft of musical musical theater. We don't tell people what to write or how to write or even what style to write in. We do talk about the craft of musical theater. Lehman used to say, uh, talent without craft is meaningless. Uh, the workshop is divided into three years, first year, second year, and third year. The third year is an ongoing year. Some people have been there for a long time. First year is unique because it's all assignments. We pair up composers and lyricists to write songs on assignments. Some of them are pretty tough. Some of them go back to the Lehman Angle days, uh, like write a song for Blanche Dubois or musicalize the suicide scene in Death of a Salesman. They're very tough assignments, but what we try to do is to get writers to write for character, which is at the, the, the center of 
the theatrical music. At the end of the second year, they can audition to get into the third year, which is an ongoing year. Some people have been in there for a long time. But um, the workshop, let me see. I have the numbers right here. Since the workshop started, uh, members have gone on to win 13 Tonys, 10 Academy Awards, 13 Grammys, and two Pulitzer Prizes. Last season, there were six musicals on Broadway that were written or co-written by members of the BMI workshop. Aladdin, School of Rock, Book of Mormon, A Bronx Tale, In Transit, and Anastasia, which is a pretty good year for us. So tell me, let's just talk about some of those, because obviously some of those people, I assume, were under your tutelage at, at some point through through the past few years. Who's uh, Who do you remember most standing out on a first day of first year that has gone on to, to big fame? We, we have things called smokers. And um, well, of course, Lynn Aarons and Steve Flaherty, they were not my students, but they were immediately pegged as a team that were going somewhere. When Jeff Marks and Bobby Lopez did If You Were Gay in the class, it just, everybody shut up and went, oh my God, these <laughs> these guys are good, watch them, uh, which we did. Bobby Lopez also met his wife, Kristen, in the workshop. So we offer a full range of services. Let me see, uh, Tom and Brian, Next to Normal started as a first year assignment. The last assignment of the year is to write a 10 minute musical. And there are really no guidelines for that. And they came in with a thing called Feeling Electric, which they expanded later on and became Next to Normal. Uh, Tom, they also they also met in the workshop. Tom just told that story on, on his podcast, oh. which is an amazing one. So when you see these people that, because I, I assume your sensitivity, obviously, to, to excellence and that raw talent that is, is heightened, what is it that you see that someone may have? Like, if, is there a specific style, characteristic? No, it's, what is it's, it? it's do you ever create magic right there in the class? I, I mean, to me, that's what it's all about. You know, we'll do five, six songs and they'll all be good. And then the next week we'll do five or six. And all of a sudden the song will come up and everybody will just shut up and there will be magic in the air. They will have created a little piece of magic right there in the class for the theater. And, and that's what I live for. And the craft of that. So let's just talk about that. We have to create magic, but obviously there's craft behind it. What's the most important thing that writers, songwriters study in order to, to find that magic? Writing for character, writing for specific characters. It's, it's very different from uh, any other kind of music. Music theater, music is very different. Uh, for the most part, theater songs need forward dramatic motion. The best theater songs don't end in the same place they began. Billy Bigelow decides he's going to get money for his child, or uh, Tevye's wife finally says that she loves him, or that's dramatic progression. The Jets decide they're going to meet the Sharks at the dance. So we have, it, it's almost like a little three-act play. It has a forward motion, and even if it, it isn't like those songs, the songs still have a forward motion. They're, they're almost like three-act plays, good theater songs. Other points of craft are they're very specific rather than a pop song. If you write a pop song called Let's Dance, it ends up pretty much in the same place as it started. But compare that to something like Shall We Dance from The King and I, where it's part of a musical scene which has a giant arc. It starts with Anna remembering her husband, asking her to dance her deceased husband, and the first time they dance, and suddenly realizing that a relationship between her and the king is building. Uh, and that all happens in the song, and it, it's quite a thing. And there's really nothing like that in, in pop song. I just, just that example, uh, the Shall We Dance, even the title or the lyric alone has drama or suspense written right into it, because you just don't know how it's going to end. Right, right. I, I, and when the king at the end of that song says, come, and they start dancing i've never been in an audience that the audience didn't go crazy just applauding and because they were on it was a journey they were on a journey i know there's we all i i ask all the composers and lyricists that come in the room how do you work lyric first music first and i'm not going to say to you or i'm not going to ask you which one is more successful than the other but do you think in all because you've seen how many songwriting teams write songs is there one that you one method that you think allows insight into character more and the answer is it depends. A lot of people work different ways. I think most of the golden age of musicals were music first. It was Rodgers and Hammerstein that actually changed all that. But before Hammerstein wrote with Rodgers, he'd written for years and years with Jerome Kern and other writers where their music came first. So to me, a lot of times when the lyrics come first, they end up in the same kind of patterns, kind of a sing-songy pattern. And if the music comes first, it, it really makes the lyricist 
think about what words go to what notes. I think the hook should come first, title of the song, so both writers know what they're writing about. Some ways that have impressed me, I mean, historically, were um, Lerner and Lowe. Fritz Lowe would sit at the piano and, and just play and make up things. And every once in a while, Lerner would go, ooh, I like that, I like that. And uh, they they would use that for a song. And that's a great way to write because you're not surprised. I mean, if you write a whole lyric and you have an idea of what it's supposed to be, and then the composer comes in with something totally different and you don't like it, there's a moment you go, oh, uh, yeah, that's good. Uh, yeah, sure. So, but in, in that way, when you work together in the same room, there's no surprise you work on the song together. So sometimes, uh, when Rick and I are working, I'll, I'll write a dummy, I'll write a dummy lyric. We'll decide on a hook and a style of music, and I'll write a dummy lyric, just what I think should go in the song. Then he'll write the real tune, and then lastly, I'll write the real lyric. And, uh, that, that seems to uh, work for us. What a Frank Lesser, I heard in the last few years, instead of writing a dummy lyric, he would write a dummy tune first. And then he would write the lyric, and then he'd go back and write the real tune. I, that's the only that's the only composer I ever heard of that did it that way. But a lot of different ways work. Actually, my favorite answer to that question is what Stephen Schwartz said. They asked him, uh, what comes first, the music or the lyrics? And he said, research. He talked a lot about that on his podcast. He spends months and months, if not longer, really thinking about what it's going to be before. That's the way to do it. That is exactly the way to do it. Uh, Robert McKee once said, uh, you should know your universe the way God knows his. Good tip. And it helps when you get into production because everybody asks you questions, as you know. You know, if you're writing about a certain world like sailing ships in the 1880s or, you know, Robin Hood and King John, people quiz you all the time. The cast comes up to you. What about, what about, what about the director comes up to you? So what, you know, and you really have to know the answer. You can't just say, oh, go look at it. What's the most common mistake, flaw, trait, whatever you want to call it, that new writers come into these days that that you recognize? The most common thing that that you need to adjust? One common thing is being too poetic. Very flowery language. Uh, Sometimes novice writers think lyrics have to be poetic, they have to be flowery, they have to use, you know, very big words. And uh, that's one of the first things. It's it's, Lyrics are not poetry. They're not prose either, but they're about halfway. And and the other thing is being, being too long, too wordy, you know, three-page lyric, you know, evenly spaced. I can't, it's too many words, you know. Every word counts in a lyric. Every word. So you have to, so you have to take a weed whacker to your lyrics. And just, just thin it out. Thin it out. What about perfect rhymes, imperfect rhyme? Do you, when you, Oh, like, what a you, ball of wax that is. Exactly. Days, so, so when you hear something on Broadway, because certainly even I hear them all the time, and some writers are like, that's fine. How do you feel about this? Oh boy. Okay. I'm going to get emails, but I don't think it's fine. I think perfect rhyme should be in the theater. It was a, it was a standard of working that from Irving Berlin to Jerry Herman to Oscar Hammerstein, they all used perfect rhymes. It was part of the craft. Big question, rap. You put rap in a musical, and if you don't know how to really write rap, people say, oh, that's not authentic, which is new to me because nobody pointed at Wonderful Town and said, oh, that's that's fake swing music, <laughs> you know. Nobody said West Side Story, oh, that's fake jazz, you know. Because theater was doing what it always did, was amalgamating all the sounds uh, uh, that were popular then. But rap seems to, has its, seems to have its own rules. And sometimes, God help me, if you perfect rhyme rap, sometimes it doesn't sound like rap. So that's still up in the air to me. I'm, but so you forgive Hamilton is what I'm, you're saying. I'm, 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 we're trying to forgive I'm trying to give. I'm trying to give <laughs> rap in musicals a pass on that. But nobody else. Well, check with me in a couple of years. We'll do some more research and yeah, figure right. it out. <laughs> So you said for the workshop, you don't tell people what to write. Except in first year. Except in first year. Do you believe that any idea can be made into a musical, though, away from the workshop? No, but I don't know what those ideas are (laughs) until somebody actually writes it. Well, you're a writer yourself. What do you look for when you go to write a musical? Uh, What should uh, it have, the characteristics that would make for a successful show? The only criteria I have is that it moves me, that I am moved by it. You know, it's a story that... uh, that's part of the reason I got into musicals because the first musical I ever saw was Carousel, and I thought, "Oh my God, what an amazing, what an amazing form! It has beautiful songs, fantastic acting. Somebody dies at the end, you cry." I thought that was how all musicals were, right? And then I saw The King and I; it was the same thing. And uh, then I saw a musical. I won't say what it was, and I didn't cry at the end. I was so disappointed. But I get over that, and I realized that the musical theater world is much larger than I thought it was. And I got to appreciate almost 
almost everything in the musical theater. Richard Anquist, who used to teach at BMI, he used to say, anything that works is a miracle. So how, I want you to imagine that someone comes into you, they don't, there's really no quote unquote talent. I mean, have you ever had someone come into the workshop on the first day and you listen to their tune and you're like, this, this guy doesn't have it. And then turns around a couple of years later and produces something. Can yeah. you can you really take someone and, and turn them into a successful writer? Would they... the, the, the turning into is, is, is a weird phrase. I don't, I don't think you turn anybody into anything. You just expose them to um, to different rules of craft and larger. Part. I mean, it, Lynn Ahrens was not a theater writer. She was a jingle writer when she came in. And within a half a year, she was the star of the class. So what you look for is a spark. And you said talent, but that's really it. Is You know, it, it can be they bring in three songs for an audition, and like two and seven-eighths of those songs can be hopeless, but maybe there's one little spark there. My God, that's a great image. You know, maybe you could build on that. So it happens. When you put people together, because now you put together thousands yeah, yeah. i mean at least what are the combinations that make for the most successful partnerships as you've watched these people either fight oh, well, now you're now you're digging into uh, trade secrets here exactly uh, that's what we do inside <laughs> edition broadway style actually the the pairings are done by my collaborator rick who uh, runs the workshop with me and he has his own method of doing that but he is very secretive about it and if i if he heard it on a podcast he'd probably be angry with it. but what do you what are the things that you think makes for a good collaboration but should people have similar styles should they be different and challenge each other should again that's all over the map i mean it's like marriage you know it's like asking what makes a good marriage or a bad marriage if people actually knew the answer to that there'd be more good marriages it's exactly like a marriage i think a I think a songwriting team would be right at home at a marriage counselor you have to be honest and yet you have to be respectful you know if you don't like something you have to say it but you got to say it without trashing your collaborator it, 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 it it's it's tough i remember uh, amy my wife picking up the phone it was no i called rick one time in the office and whoever picked up the phone said uh, rick it's your other wife and and it's it's really accurate in fact there are some terrible jealousies going on between spouses and collaborators they're jealous of the time that they spend with their collaborator so yes it, it, yes a marriage if you look at all the relationships of famous teams it, it's all very interesting gilbert and solomon couldn't stand each other they, they couldn't even be in the same room with each other. They hated it. They broke up to uh, write individually and realized that they weren't going anywhere individually. So they got back together again, but they still hated each other. Oscar Hammerstein wrote in his book that he never actually knew if Richard Rodgers liked it. I found that astounding. But every everything is a, is a different case. And sometimes when those collaborations break up, it is like a marriage. I mean, Sheldon Harnett talks about splitting with Jerry Bach. And as he talks about it, it hurts me. You know, I, I feel his pain in that separation. How are how different are new writers today or younger writers today than they were 10 years ago? Do you see a difference? Yes. And that's a very exciting part, too, because every generation is going to have its own voice, you know, and it's not going to be the voice that I like most. And it's not going to be it's going to be their own voice of uh, Mormon, Evan Hansen, Hamilton. They're all a, of a new generation. It's a new voice. You know, I talk about craft, but that kind of thing just happens with a generation. There's there's no predicting anything like what the new generation is going to sound like. Now, critics always critics always try to predict or tell writers what they should be writing. You know, this is the new thing, this is that. And they are always wrong. Critics are always wrong. Nobody predicted the integrated book musical. You know, nobody predicted the Euro musical or the concept musical. These things just happened. And then we dealt with them as they happened. Went, wow, you know, a different voice, a different sound. And what do you think about the current state of the Broadway musical? You've mentioned a lot of the big classic golden age musicals, right? You mentioned Carousel, King and I. How do you think the industry is doing right now in terms of the new musicals it's churning out? Well, I think it's doing fine. I wish there were some things I wish were more ubiquitous in the, in the musical theater. I like perfect rhyming. <laughs> you know, I like I like subtext. And there's a, there's a lack of subtext on Broadway. Subtext is at the very heart of what I love about the theater. It's that subtext is very few people actually say what they mean to each other. And that hidden meaning that the audience picks up on that subtext 
but you have a whole range of musicals that characters just come out and sing whatever's on their mind. And there's no mystery to it. There's no, the audience isn't going, what does he really think? You know what I mean? And I enjoy, I enjoy that subtext. And there's, I think there's less of it than there used to be. Can you give us an example of a real great moment in musical theater of subtext? Oh, any, any one of the golden age. You can go back to Oklahoma where they're singing, uh, people will say we're in love. You know, they're singing exactly the opposite of, of, of what they feel. Or in Chicago, the lawyer comes out and sings, all I care about is love. And it makes you laugh because you, you know what a scam it is. So, I mean, th- that's subtext. And you find that just a little bit lacking in some of the new I stuff. Do, I yeah. do. But well, like Stephen Sondheim, I, I'm not going to, I only critique dead authors. <laughs> Probably smart in this business. And what about the, do you think the process, how has technology changed the process of songwriting, made it easier, made it harder? Do you think people collaborating over Skype is a good thing or? No, I don't. I think. You don't. I think they should be in the same room. I think better songs come out of being in the same room. It's it's harder and harder. And sometimes it doesn't happen that way. But I, I think the work is better when you're in the same room creating it. What do you think is the best musical ever written? Uh, I can't, can't Come on. I can't yes, you can. That. Okay, I'll frame it a little bit differently because I know people ask me that all the time. If, if you were on a deserted island that also had a theater and a musical theater company yeah. and could only pick one show to watch for the rest of your life, what show would it be? The Music Man. That's my guilty pleasure. I love that show. I love Harold Hill. It, 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 as far as great music, great lyrics, and all of that, I have other shows that I like. Really? Well, like so best, you... best score I'd give to West Side Story, hence, musically. I don't know, Sweeney Todd is certainly up there. I mean, but, you know, I love a lot of shows. It's like saying, what's your favorite song? It's, it's... But this is interesting to me. So Music Man, you, you just have a special place in your heart for Music Man. You choose that in the deserted island. Well, you know why? Uh, uh, it, it's not only because I love the songs and I love the story and the characters, but the whole idea of that is, is so good. There's a depth to that show. What that show is saying is anything can be music if you will only hear it. The train ride, that's music. The women gossiping, that's music. The four guys arguing together as a barbershop quartet, that's music. And Harold Hill is the man that brings music to, to River City, and they all hear it at the end. And every song has something to do with that. And that's what I love about this show. And and it, it, it culminates in that lyric, there were bells on the hill, but I never heard them till there was you. And usually I've had a couple of brandies by that time, and I'm crying on the floor. <laughs> You're a big softie, we've learned oh, on this yes. podcast. Oh, yes. Well, most musical theater people are softies. So, uh, look, the BMI workshop is a very competitive workshop. You have how many students, new students every year? About about 35. About 35. And you get how many applications about every year? Maybe about 300. 300. So you're taking about 10%. It's a very low admission rate. And there's a lot of people out there that I'm sure would love to be in the workshop but can't be in the workshop. Either they weren't accepted or they just are at a place in the country where they can't get here every Monday night. Right. What What's your advice to those people that really want to write for the theater, but that can't be in a workshop? There, there isn't a workshop for them nearby. What's the training that they sh- they should do on their own? Homeschooling, it. librettos and scores, and read through them. How is this put together? You know, where does it breathe? Where does where does the action go forward? What do the songs do for this scene? You can learn an, an amazing amount, and and now you can get the score or libretto to almost anything. Uh, um, and, and just look at them, study them, write something just like something else, just to get the feel of, uh, of writing that, you know, take, take a show apart, find a show you like and write a show like it, exactly structured that way, just as a learning process. What do these authors do? How did they do that? I find that a lot of new writers that I talk to, lots of people have ideas for musicals, but it's of course hard to sit down and start and get it going. When you personally, when you start a new musical, where where do you start? Do you start at the beginning, the end, the middle? No, I start. I start. I start the second song from the beginning because the opening. You don't want to write the opening right away because the opening is what your show is about, and you probably don't even know what your show is about when you first start writing it. So the opening is one of the last things you do once you realize what your show is about. I start with the character establishment songs. That's what I call them. They BMI used to call them the I M songs, but I didn't think that was a good description. It's when your main character characters sing. They establish themselves in song. And to me, those are the most important songs. Among my favorite songs of any show. But they're the hardest ones to do. They say, come on board with this story. Come on board with this character. Uh, Tevye sings If I Were a Rich Man. 
and you say, I'll follow you anywhere. It shows his character. He doesn't necessarily come out and say, I am Tevye and I am... He sings, If I Were a Rich Man, a little off the point, but it reveals him. And uh, those are the toughest songs, songs to write. Once again, what's interesting about that, there's suspense, If I Were a Rich Man. It's like, shall we do We just don't know what the, the outcome is. Uh, there's some suspense. Right, and very there. often a, a character will come out and the first thing he'll sing is something that he wants that he doesn't want by the end of the show. But those are the toughest songs. Look, second or third song into the show, those are the characters that we know. In the very first half of Act One, all the main characters usually sing. They all have their song. You know, Henry Higgins, it's I'm an Ordinary man. It reveals his character. If you get those songs right, you are 75% ahead of the game. If you get them wrong, you're cooked <laughs> because those are the songs that people have to hop on board. What do you think about the, the musical movies? What do you think about movies that are made from, from musicals lately? Do you like them? Do you find... I'd like Chicago. You kind of have to reinvent musical films. People say, well, it wasn't like the show. Well, it can't be like the show. It's so close up. It's so detailed. You know, Some, I, I just put on my, you know, Aristotle denial glasses and I imagine it on stage usually, you know. But Chicago was terrific, I thought. Uh, um, anyway, n not not my genre uh, film. So, uh, Any words of wisdom for those people out there that really do dream about writing a big Broadway hit someday? Uh, come to New York. You, be you believe everyone should be here if that's what they want to do. This is, this is where the theater is, right? Okay, my last question, which is my genie question. I want you to imagine that the genie from Aladdin... Did you like Aladdin? I did. Great. Imagine the genie from Aladdin comes to visit you, knocks on your office door and says, Pat, I want to thank you for helping to shape so many musicals over the past several years. You listed all those Tonys and Grammys and Pulitzer Prize winners that came out of the workshop. So your fingerprints are on some of those shows. He wants to thank you for that by granting you one wish. What's the one thing that drives you really crazy about Broadway, that gets you angry, mad, could have you ripping up a playbill, tearing it in two, that you'd ask this genie to wish away in an instant? I guess the elitism, how much it costs to see a show. When I was growing up, I could sit in the balcony for $3, and I could see all the great shows. And just, I wonder if people like me when I was a kid are being priced out of the experience. I really worry about that. Yeah, it's something we all worry about and talk about a lot in this business, especially now with the age of variable pricing. It seems to even be getting more expensive up there in the valley. Well, thank you so much for all that you do. Uh, thanks to all of you for listening. Reminder, Pat will be moderating our writers panel at our conference on November 11th and 12th, so don't hesitate to register for that. It's going to be an exciting day. It's going to be, you're going to teach some very good lessons. You're going to get to ask uh, Lynn Aaron some questions, yeah. Lynn Slater some questions. Yeah. It's going to be terrific. So join us for the conference. Thanks again for listening. Thanks to you, Pat. We'll see you Thank next you. time. Don't forget to sign up to come to our super conference on November 11th and 12th. Go to theproducersperspective.com, sign up today, and we'll see you right here in New York City. Oh!